Hello everyone. So in this video, I would like to highlight our recent work on the cutting cost of uh, molecular Hamiltonian encodings for linear combination of unitaries. And so for people who are familiar with this uh, approach, just uh, want to start with a small summary. What do we really achieve here? Uh, you're all familiar that uh, when we encode the uh, molecular Hamiltonian as LCU, then there is a one norm cost uh, associated uh, with the terms of the Hamiltonian. And in this work, we just modify the Hamiltonian to reduce that cost. So we create this uh, extra K operator that if you remove from H the K part, uh, the effective Hamiltonian still acts the same way on the eigenstates of interest and on the initial state uh, that you prepare usually in the quantum phase estimation, okay? So what we usually use uh, to characterize the states of interest is number of electrons, uh, because in chemistry, we are generally interested in a specific number of electrons. All right, but for everybody else, uh, let me just uh, start with a reminding that uh, in linear combination of unitaries, what do we really use it for? Uh, the main purpose is that uh, we would like to present the Hamiltonian uh, in some unitary form for quantum computer. And uh, this could be useful for uh, essentially uh, Taylor uh, expansion of the propagator if you want to do quantum phase estimation that way, right? So then for a small time, it's a pretty good approximation. And then H, since it's not unitary, and we want to have unitary operators, uh, LCU is uh, helpful. And uh, more advanced technique like qubitization can use uh, this LCU decomposition as well. I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, this is more advanced technique and uh, requires quite a bit of an explanation. So I did this in previous videos uh, at some point. Uh, and then uh, for us, the main... I guess uh, topic of this video will be how to reduce one norm of, for the coefficients of the LCU decomposition, right? And uh, because the cost of uh, all these methods uh, scales linearly, practically with the number, uh, with, with this number essentially, right? And so that's all you need to know. And this is our uh, sole purpose is to reduce the one norm. Now in uh, quantum chemistry, one way to encode the Hamiltonian to go from fermions to uh, qubits is to use second quantized form of the Hamiltonian. We have uh, a simple mapping between fermions to qubits where x, y, z's are the Pauli operators, right? And this is jordan Wigner mapping. There are other forms like uh, people use first quantization as well, but uh, this is very, uh, second quantized form is very simple. And uh, we like it because of that. Uh, if you do this jordan Wigner mapping, you get isospectral qubit Hamiltonian, where you get linear combination of Pauli products, large P's, right? And uh, it's isospectral. Uh, so if you diagonalize HQ, you get the same spectrum as uh, initial Hamiltonian. But the cost of this simplicity is that uh, we are working in the Fox space and there are lots of uh, states in the Fox space uh, with a number of electrons that are different than what we maybe uh, want to investigate, right? So it's anion, cations, and uh, all the multiple charges, right? So it's all contained in the Fox space. Now, if we're in the business of reducing one norm, uh, it's interesting to know what is the lowest one norm of the uh, linear combination of unitary that you can uh, but potentially achieve. So it's instructive to consider every Hamiltonian like uh, some shift of identity or identity is unitary, but it's trivial. So it can be easily removed from the consideration of the propagator, right? So that's why uh, the S is sort of a free parameter and uh, any non-trivial unitary part is uh, written here. And so what we uh, care about is to understand what's the uh, lowest uh, bound of the of the one norm. Now, turns out uh, you can you can do it 
considering this uh, sequence of inequalities. And let's uh, start with uh, this part where you subtract, uh, you consider non-trivial part of the uh, Hamiltonian where you subtract the identity, right? And so you look at the uh, spectral norm uh, that can be always uh, uh, lower or kind of uh, upper bounded by uh, triangle inequality with the spectral norm of unitaries being one, you get the one norm of the coefficients. And so one norm of coefficients is going to always be bigger than this uh, uh, spectral norm of H minus S. And uh, it turns out that uh, this quantity in its uh, turn sort of uh, always bigger than uh, this delta E divided by two. What delta E divided by two is, is uh, really related to the so-called uh, spectral range of the Hamiltonian. So if you look at the Hamiltonian, uh, eigenvalues, they are all between, say, largest and lowest uh, eigenvalues, right? And uh, this uh, delta E is uh, spectral range, as we call it, the difference between largest and lowest. Now, you could uh, always uh, shift uh, this S uh, freely to move the spectrum around. And because the spectral range, uh, sorry, spectral norm of H minus SI, is always going to be uh, the largest uh, eigenvalue of uh, this shifted Hamiltonian. So the, the lowest value that you can get for this largest eigenvalue is the delta E divided by two, because uh, to make this uh, spectral norm the smallest, you would want to shift the spectrum uh, symmetrically around the zero, right? And so this delta E divided by two is uh, half of the spectral range. It's always going to be uh, minimizing the uh, this uh, spectral norm with respect to shift. Okay, and so that uh, allows us to say that uh, one norm is always going to be bigger than this uh, spectral range divided by two. Okay, so that's essentially hard limit. You cannot make no matter what unitaries you choose, you cannot make the one norm uh, better than the delta e divided by two. Of course, one way around this is to change the Hamiltonian. Because if you change the Hamiltonian, the spectrum will change and the, you can have a chance to change the delta E divided by two. All right. Now, this is exactly what we're doing in our approach, which we call Bliss. And uh, we just uh, subtracting from the Hamiltonian some part that does not change the action of the Hamiltonian on the eigenstates of interest and on the initial state that we uh, also creating some sort of symmetric state with the right number of electrons. Now the K part in order to achieve this uh, is created this expression, which is really uh, quite simple. If you think about it, this number of electron operator, and this is the constant, uh, the number of electrons that we're interested in, in the state that we are trying to, pre uh, trying to well, prepare and then uh, get as a result of quantum phase estimation, right? So these guys, the linear term and quadratic term, make sure that when K acts on the right state with the right number of electrons, K is not doing anything. Essentially, it, it creates zero. And then there is a freedom into cho in choosing the other parts of K. Uh, the, this, this is a general one electron operator where you have alpha and betas, uh, three parameters. And then in the uh, quadratic part, we have only constant. Uh, why the form is chosen like that? Simply because we want K to be uh, two electron. There is a possibility to go to the high electron cases, but uh, then it's, uh, it's complicated with the optimization, essentially, because the Hamiltonian itself is two electron. And so, the way we find K is essentially we trying to optimize these three parameters to reduce one norm uh, for the H minus K decomposition. And the easiest decomposition to consider is a linear combination of Paulis. So you just go to H minus K uh, to the qubit form and you sort of optimize the lambda uh, with respect to the parameters alpha, beta, right? And that's how we find K. Now, some... Uh, comments here is that K, even though it uses symmetries, uh, 
uh, it's not symmetry itself and it does need to be, right? So the only thing we need from K is that uh, the states with the right number of electrons, K uh, doesn't change them, okay? So K acting on the right symmetry block uh, just produce zeros. And uh, using other symmetries beyond the number of electrons is also possible. Uh, but uh, it turned out to be not very efficient. We, we tried it and uh, it didn't quite uh, work very well uh, in this particular case. Now, what would we call successful search, uh, results of a successful search for K? Uh, success would look like uh, if H minus K has the spectral range, the same as if we work just with the right number of electrons. Right, so if we project the Hamiltonian to the right number of electron uh, block and look at the spectral range only there, then that's the uh, absolutely the best result you can get uh, through subtracting the k. And so here we look whether we are close to this ideal case uh, with the small molecules and small bases. Turns out that everywhere. Uh, beyond this uh, blue uh, rectangle, uh, that uh, we actually recovering the spectral range of H minus K to be the same as the spectral range of um, uh, the situation where we project uh, explicitly only to the uh, subspace with the right number of electrons, uh, which is a neutral case in this case, right? And uh, only in the situations with beryllium H2 and ammonia, we have... Uh, uh, slightly bigger spectral ranges for H minus K, uh, but the difference is uh, about a few percent, uh, not more. So we are quite happy with the, the search that we did for K. And uh, once we know how to modify the Hamiltonian to reduce the spectral range, we now can ask a, a different question, uh, whether we can find the unitaries that uh, produce uh, better one norm than, say, a simple uh, Pauli products, right? So they are good, but can we do better? And it turns out that in qubit, uh, say, representation, even though Pauli products already LCU, it's quite simple LCU, and it, you can do better uh, by grouping Pauli products. So the way you group Pauli products, if you just do arbitrarily grouping, then you will lose the property that uh, the group will be a unitary operator. But if you careful and uh, satisfy certain relations, like uh, for example, you group anti-commuting Pauli products with the normal uh, normalization of their coefficients, turns out that you can obtain unitaries uh, that way. That's at least one way to uh, create the unitaries, bigger unitaries out of the linear combination Pauli products. And uh, if you do the algebra, actually, you can see that uh, one norm of uh, grouped operators uh, will be always uh, smaller than the one norm that uh, of non-grouped uh, initial uh, representation of the Hamiltonian and qubit uh, space. Okay. Now, you also can do things in the fermionic fragments. Uh, before going to qubit space, you can uh, realize, okay, I, these are my uh, LCUs, and then when you go to the qubit space, the LCU, essentially unitary, will stay unitary because the fermion to qubit transformation doesn't change that. And uh, it is instructive here to start with uh, fragments that are so-called Hartree-Fox solvable. We introduced them in this work. And uh, the way they are created, uh, we're using here the idea that uh, it's easy to create uh, fragments which are exactly solvable with the uh, orbital rotations if the uh, fragments are one electron right so you create uh, essentially with orbital rotations linear combination for occupation numbers and then uh, for creating the two electron fragments like that all you need is just to substitute linear combination of occupations by a quadratic uh, form for the occupation numbers. And every occupation number essentially when you go to the qubit space uh, becomes a uh, Z operator. So this is like a diagonal form of the operator and the orbital rotations are just hiding that, right? But uh, in general, these uh, fragments, they are exactly solvable by doing the orbital rotations.
And it turns out that decomposing Hamiltonian and such fragments allow you to do LCU decomposition very uh, efficiently. So what we do, we minimize uh, sort of decomposition, uh, the difference between the initial Hamiltonian and the sum of the such fragments. And in those fragments, uh, we have uh, orbital rotations that are uh, sort of hiding the occupation number uh, quadratic forms. And then in order to move things to unitaries, uh, it's actually quite simple because our occupation numbers are really projectors. And uh, to turn projectors to reflections, which are Hermitian unitaries, all you need is just to multiply by two and subtract one, right? So then you get the reflection uh, out of the projector. And then uh, for the two electron Hamiltonians, you have two uh, possible reflections. It's either rotation of the one electron reflection, which is a single occupation number operator, or you can do unitary rotations of the products of two reflections, right? So that's the two electron reflections. At any rate, your Hamiltonian becomes a linear combination of these uh, reflection operators. That's what you can do in fermionic um, representation before going to the qubit space. All right, so now let's see some results of this. Uh, the usual way we represent the results uh, is in this form of, um, we essentially consider that uh, uh, if you do LCU using Pauli products, this is the most trivial and simple LCU one can do. And all other uh, LCUs that use grouping should uh, improve on that. So then if you put, say, a set of molecules, uh, results for them in various LCU methods as a y-axis, uh, one norm for the different LCU methods, versus one norm that uh, you have for the Pauli decomposition, then the this is the most straightforward Pauli uh, LCU will be a uh, line with the slope 45 degree, right? Slope one. Um, and then all other LCUs should be lower than uh, or have a smaller slope than the Pauli LCU. The lowest, of course, is just the delta E divided by two spectral range. Uh, okay, so you cannot go lower than that. All the Grouping techniques usually have uh, some slope between the Pauli and the delta E divided by two. Of course, if you change the Hamiltonian, uh, slope will be even lower, but still will be lower bounded by its delta E divided by two. And so here we can see that uh, uh, compared to the Pauli uh, uh, LCU for the Hamiltonian, what are the slopes of different methods? The lower the slope, the better, right? And uh, so this is absolute lowest uh, slope for the Hamiltonian because of the spectral range, right? So it gives uh, the gain of uh, roughly two uh, in the cost of the uh, kind of LCU QP uh, quantum phase estimation scheme. And now uh, if you subtract the K, then the spectral range uh, gets even uh, lower slope. This is absolutely the best you can get. Uh, no grouping will be able to beat this, right? So this is uh, as much as you can squeeze out of the of this uh, technique. But interestingly, if you subtract K and do the trivial power decomposition, your gains will be as uh, good as, uh, or even actually better than the uh, what would be the lower bound without the K for the original Hamiltonian. And then uh, another uh, consideration here, which is quite interesting, is that if we do various grouping techniques, like either in qubit space, anti-commuting Paulis, or fermionic space, uh, they're pretty close. Uh, they actually, the, the gains are getting close to the lower bounds. So in the H minus K case, right? So we are pretty close to the absolute lowest uh, one norm that one can get. Uh, with these techniques, and uh, they will provide roughly close to factor of three uh, reduction in cost uh, for the LCU. So if you want to know more details on this, uh, this is the reference, and uh, thank you all for your attention.